As we continue to read and study and to be moved by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we also realize how familiar those words are to us, and because they're so familiar, we often uh, miss the really radical impact of what Jesus was saying to the people of his times. As he was uh, teaching them the different parts of the Sermon on the Mount, There were those listening who found that he was challenging them to step beyond just the rituals to actually live in the heart of God. From the fifth chapter, let us listen to these words of Jesus speaking to our hearts. You have heard that it is said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the fire of hell. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, remember, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. May God bless to us this challenge from Jesus for us to look beyond just the baseline of the law. Thanks be to God. Speaking about the law and crime, there is a story. I don't think it's exactly one of Jesus' parables, but there is a story that involves Jesus. A burglar broke into a house, and he started shining his flashlight around looking for valuables. There were some things that caught his eye, and he was reaching for them to put into his bag, and he heard a voice saying, Jesus is watching you. He was startled, and he looked around, but he didn't see a speaker, and he thought, well, maybe I'm just hearing things. And so seeing no one, he kept putting things in his bag, and again he heard, Jesus is watching you. This time, he twirled around with his flashlight, and he saw a parrot. (laughs) And the burglar said to the parent, who are you? And the bird replied, Moses. (laughs) And the burglar said, now, who would name a bird Moses? And the bird said, I don't know. I guess the same people that would name a Rottweiler Jesus. Different Jesus. Like I said, I don't think that's one of Jesus' parables. Um, But there is a lesson from that story, and I think if the Pharisees and the scribes heard that story, this is what they would have taken from it. Listen carefully and respectfully to Moses, but keep your eye out for Jesus. You know, they probably did kind of think of Jesus as something like a theological attack dog in their time. Because look how Jesus took those very straightforward commandments that Moses had given them, which, by the way, the scribes and Pharisees had found ways to do a workaround if needed. And then he pushed the fulfilling of those rules to such, they thought, an extreme point. How could they possibly complete them and check them off and rationalize those commandments away? Jesus wanted to have those commandments imprinted on their hearts, just like that troublemaker Jeremiah did and all of the other prophets. They thought to themselves, you know, Jesus is making us look powerless. We're supposed to be the righteous and the powerful ones Why can't Jesus talk about something else? 
You know, this time of year, I sometimes think, why didn't Jesus talk about something else, like maybe talk about, you know, snow, ice, cold. Give me some good illustrations. Yeah, I realize that uh, as convenient as that would be, there wasn't really a lot of snow and ice in Palestine. So that's just wishful thinking on my preaching, preaching part. But what did Jesus preach about? Jesus preached about uncomfortable topics like power in the world. He spoke of covenant power. He spoke of kingdom of God power. Jesus talked a lot about power. And he related that power to what Moses had given over to the people, but also how those rules became a part of God's covenant through Moses and the Ten Commandments as a baseline to help guide the people. And so Jesus preached to the powerful about how very little power they really had unless they were connected to the heart of God. And to the powerless in his time, those who felt they were running out of power, Jesus said, you have a source of incredible power, infinite power, more than you can imagine, just for your asking. The power of God is free for the asking. Honoree and I had some friends that ran out of power a few times in eastern Pennsylvania. They ran out of power after Superstorm Sandy decided to come through New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. And then when there was a heavy snow and ice event, once again, they ran out of power. Or more precisely, the power stopped coming to them. The connection was lost. And for three days and nights, that sounds biblical, doesn't it? For three days and nights, our friends had to huddle in their cold house while the power company was trying to reconnect them. Clear the trees that had fallen, put back up fallen wires, restore transformers. Finally, power was restored. The next time this type of event happened, they were ready. They had purchased a Honda gasoline generator. And so when that next storm shut them down, they knew they would reconnect. They would have power in reserve for tough times. And that's what Jesus was talking about. Power in reserve for the tough times. You see, for Jesus' people in his times, the connections had been lost. There was this covenant relationship that had been formed between God and God's people, and they thought they still had it because they had this long list of rules. For the Pharisees, it was like 670 rules to be kept. The lines seemed to be in place, and yet the power was not connecting to them. It was lost. The people were not connected. In New York City, there is a pastor at the Big Baptist Church in downtown Manhattan named Reverend Susan Sparks, and she has an interesting dual career. She is both a pastor and also a professional comedian. Yeah, so, so a lot of people go listening for the things that she says. But in one of Susan Sparks' more serious moments, she, she said this, Faith is like this, too. God is the power source, and we are the cord, the connection. We can choose to have faith and plug into this ultimate life force, or we can choose to plug into the things of this world, which have no power, things that will leave us in a cold and dark place. And she said, let me give you an example of a simple three step prayer that might help. First, give thanks to God for life. Second, name the things that block you from God's life-giving power. And third, ask God for help to give those things up. Three steps. Plugging into the power of God makes extraordinary things happen. Things we don't expect things we might <laughs> not even want at times. But when we're living the Christ life, 
there's a level of meaning and power in this world that truly does rock the boat and changes things. One of the, the best ways of approaching the matter is put by a, a theologian named Douglas John Hall, perhaps one of the best system, <coughs> systematic theologians in North America in recent history. He asks a simple question that feels like a central question for our times. What is the significant purpose for which I exist in my life? What is the significant purpose for which I exist in my life? Douglas John Hall writes that the, the, the one thing that runs through all Jewish and Christian theology is a dual purpose, accountability to care for those for whom we matter, and responsibility to care for the things that matter to God. We're pretty good with the first one, to care for those for whom we matter. It's the latter one that seems to trip us up. It's in caring for the things that matter to God that we find that we have to be, all people of faith, way above average. Can we be average Christians? Can we just do the minimum expected? Or are we called to be like the children of Lake Wobegon where they're all above average? Jesus tells us, he tells us that our righteousness, our faith and practice and justice and mercy and compassion and love of God and love of each other must exceed that of those who hold themselves up to be the gold standard for religious practices. So we have to ask, is Jesus making this impossible for us? No, I think it's just the opposite. Jesus is asking us to give up constantly trying to control and to limit our faith by giving over control of our faith and life to God. Because when we do that, there are no longer any limits to what God can do through us. And in that way, by giving control over to God, we will always be way above average when we're doing what God wants us to do. And that's called a leap of faith. A leap of faith. Now, what does the leap of faith look like? I think it looks like a tipping point. What is a tipping point? You may have read a book by Malcolm Gladwell that was popular some years back. It basically was talking about how you can do things incrementally, step by step by step toward a goal, and at some point you tip over, like a car that's cresting a hill, or a roller coaster that's going over the top, or a match catching fire, or a balloon popping that leads to a a tipping point, he called it. And the tipping point, it may seem that we're doing something slow and tedious and incremental, but suddenly it can tip over and something marvelous can happen. One incredible tipping point that I recall from ministry was a program, a ministry called Pedals for Progress. Now, this was started by a guy named Dave Schweidenbach. And he was from a church called the Swedenborgian Church. So he was the Swedenborgian Schweidenbach. Try saying that five times fast. But Dave had the idea that if he could collect bicycles or bicycle parts and could put them together into bikes that were functioning, not beautiful, but functioning, and they could be in the developing world in small villages, that it could help the people there. Because if there was someone who had a skill or someone who had an ability, like a plumber or electrician, instead of doing two jobs a day with a bicycle, they could do five jobs a day. And it would bring income into the community and people could then start new businesses and it would move along like that, and it did. It plotted along like that. But suddenly when 25% of the people in a remote village in, say, in Central America or in Africa 
had bicycles, suddenly the economy, instead of just incrementally increasing, would suddenly jump about 40 or 50 percent. It was a tipping point that was reached, and it was always about the same percentage that it tipped that way. Now, that was all from things people were throwing away, people putting by the curb or having bike, you know, having bike collections. And Dave found out something. He heard or he read in the paper that Sears was going to repackage all of their bike parts from what were called bike extras to then branding them as Sears. So they couldn't unpackage them and then repackage them and sell them. They were going to have to dispose of all of these parts from all of their stores at significant cost for disposal. And so he said to them, I'll, I'll take them from you. And Sears agreed. And then he talked to Sealand Container, and they said, oh, this is a great idea. We'll give you a container. And so they filled up an entire Sealand Container with new bike parts and shipped them off to Central America. And it became part of a huge sharing of bicycles and ideas. The tipping point just kept tipping more and more. Jesus was talking about us trusting God to give us ideas and to take the initiative that makes a difference. He talked about exceeding the self-righteous behaviors of the pious of his day. He was also talking about living in God's ways, of taking faith and putting it into simple, compassionate, practical acts of caring and involvement with the needs of others moving forward God's tipping points in life because those tipping points are more numerous than we can count. But those tipping points depend on us. God's tipping points depend on us. Faith that exceeds the righteousness of the day. You know, over many years, I've heard people in churches very sadly and, and very faithfully, but very sadly bemoan what they don't think that they can do or they can attempt or that they can even dream about because they'll say, well, we're, we're just not religious enough or we're not trained enough or we're not funded enough or we're not skilled enough or young enough or old enough or whatever enough. We can't do it. But you know, I've never heard God asking us to be religious to some point or trained to some point or skilled to some point or to be a particular age or situation. God just asks us to be faithful enough. Faithful enough. And so the message today is that God gave us commandments through Moses. And they're a starting point, but not a tipping point. God called Israel, Jesus called the church to let God move us from the starting point to the tipping points. And that is, as Deuteronomy said, about choosing life, choosing blessing, choosing faith that matters. We can do this. Or we can keep doing what for generations Churches have always done and have been satisfied with. The question is, is it God's satisfaction for us to be self-satisfied? Self or do we do as Jesus said, go and do likewise? Friends, let's go and do likewise because in that is life, blessing, grace, love, and faith. So let's do it. Amen.